Well, hi there. This is a Komodo dragon, which is a bit of a funny name. Dragon is usually reserved for members of the family Agamidae, like bearded dragons, water dragons, and horned dragons. That said, seems fitting. While herpetologists may refer to agamids as dragons, most people think of large, fire-breathing, flying reptiles that go around burninating the countryside. So given that this is the largest lizard alive today, and possibly the only extant lizard that would see a human peasant as a potential meal, if they aren't dragons, what is? I'll show you in a minute. Because for as impressive as Komodo dragons are, they may actually be an example of a phenomenon called insular dwarfism, where normally large species become smaller on small islands. And you may wonder why I'm holding a snake while I'm talking about this. But I'm holding this snake because she too is an example of insular dwarfism. And she has something else in common with Komodo dragons because she only has one parent. She has a mom, but no dad. And this is not uncommon for Komodo dragons. However, there is a big difference because Athena here is a female. And when Komodo dragons reproduce asexually, a phenomenon called facultative parthenogenesis, the offspring are never female. Females can clone themselves, but they only produce males. Whereas reticulated pythons, the longest of all snakes, only produce females. And the reason for this is the same. So let's start with Komodo. I think everyone knows that it's an island, but most people probably have no idea where it is. It's located right here, almost straight south of the Solaire Archipelago, where the super dwarf reticulated pythons are found. Both are part of what is today called Indonesia. And Komodo dragons are not only found on Komodo Island itself, but actually on five total islands. Komodo, Rinka, Gili Dasami, Gili Motang, and the largest of all, Flores. They also existed on the island of Padar, but they have been extirpated from there, as well as most of the island of Flores. Now, if you've ever heard of the island of Flores before, it might be because you're a fan of hobbits. Not the Lord of the Rings ones, but the real ones, Homo floresiensis. And if you know one thing about them, it's that they were small, just over one meter tall. I'm not sure how hairy their feet were. But we will talk more about them later this year when we dive into the phylogeny of creatures more closely related to humans than our chimpanzees. You may also be familiar with the dwarf elephant-like proboscideans such as Stegodon florensis, also dwarf, also named for the island of Flores. Because Flores, while the largest island on which Komodo dragons reside, is still a relatively small island. And as such, the fauna on the island are susceptible to some of the strange island phenomena that we often observe on small islands, such as dwarfism. But not just dwarfism. I mean, this is a giant tortoise, and the largest tortoises, by far, are found on islands. So sometimes animals get huge, and the Komodo dragon is one of the most conspicuous examples of a giant species living on small islands. Which is why it's so strange to hear that there is little evidence that these giant lizards are the result of insular gigantism, and that they might be an example of insular dwarfism. So let's talk about insular dwarfism and gigantism for a second, and then we will try to figure out what is going on with the Komodo dragon, which we might want to rename the Flores Pygmy Dragon, but we'll just have to wait and see. I just want to take a moment to express my appreciation to our patrons on Patreon who make content like this possible. Obviously, this is this is a little bit of a different video for us. Really fun. I'm 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 really enjoying it and, you know, if if you're enjoying this also, please join me in thanking our patrons and if you want to see more content like this in the future, please consider joining them. So, what makes islands so weird? Well, for starters, as we discussed in our video on the Afrotheria, it can be challenging just to get to islands. So the number of lineages on those islands is often rather limited, which I think has something to do with why parthenogenesis, especially facultative parthenogenesis, seems to be so much more common on islands. But we'll get to that here shortly. What matters right now is that there aren't very many lineages, and often a lot of open niche space. Resources are available that, on the mainland, are being utilized by some other lineage, that isn't present on the island. So there may be reduced competition. 
Also, in many cases, your predators aren't present on the island, especially because it's extremely difficult to survive as a large predator on an island. So you can be a giant flightless pigeon with no fear of anything and be just fine. But the total amount of food on the island is also often limited compared to the mainland. So it can be difficult to maintain a large population of very large animals, especially if those animals use energy from food to maintain a constant body temperature. So for things like proboscideans, it might be difficult to maintain a large population on the island, which can mean that your population is very susceptible to going extinct. It is a lot easier to drive a population of say 10 giant elephants to extinction than it is to drive a population of like a thousand mammals that are one one hundredth the size of an elephant to extinction. The same biomass, but different extinction probabilities. If for no other reason than that the likelihood of having a generation where all ten are the same sex is not that unlikely. And when insular dwarfism was taught to me in school, this was the reason that I was given for why large animals get smaller on islands. And because islands can't really support large endotherms, that allows ectotherms like tortoises that require much less food to grow large to fill the role of large herbivore. No competition from mammals and probably no large predators either. But the longer I've thought about this, the less I think this tells the whole story. It might explain why colonizations of large mammals rarely last long and why they often go extinct on islands, but it doesn't really explain why they would get smaller over time. Evolution doesn't plan for the future. And this isn't something that happens just every now and then. Insular dwarfism has happened multiple times just in proboscideans, just on the island of Flores. And that is far from the only place or lineage where this has occurred. We can observe from the fossil record on these islands that not only were the proboscideans eventually very small, but older fossils larger. So it isn't that only small proboscideans can colonize islands successfully, but rather that large ones can colonize and something makes them get smaller. And it can't be that they're worried that their population is susceptible to extinction so they stay small to avoid a future extinction. Evolution doesn't work that way. So how does it work then? The reality is that something on the island needs to be selecting for small body size and large animals. And since this is actually one of my areas of expertise as someone who studies life history evolution, I'm glad we get to talk about it. So what would select for smaller body size? I mean, what are the advantages of being smaller? Well, for one, you don't need as much food to survive. This can definitely be an advantage on an island where large amounts of food may not always be possible to find. Even if periods of famine are rather rare, when they do occur, in some cases, only the small may survive. And that would impact the population on that island from that point on. So that could certainly be part of the equation. Growing to a smaller size may also mean that you can mature earlier, begin to reproduce sooner, and have shorter gestation times. All are potentially advantageous, unless you are in a highly competitive environment or smaller size places you at significantly greater risk of predation. If the island is not full of competitors or large predators, as islands often are not, then small body size would be advantageous there too. Plus, small body size, at least in tropical places, makes it easier to regulate your body temperature. Small animals have a much higher surface area to volume ratio than do larger animals. But I should add that Flores didn't have only tiny elephants and people, but R-O-U-S's. That's right, giant rats. One is still alive today. Because the absence of large mammalian predators, as well as large herbivores, can allow smaller animals to get larger. So large animals often become smaller, but small animals often become larger. From rats to pigeons to tortoises. But what about dragons? Well, in reptile predators, like Komodo dragons and reticulated pythons, size seems to be most tied to the size of the prey available to them. If you live on an island with no large animals to eat, then it's hard to get by as a giant snake. And thus, insular dwarfism seems to be the rule for large boas and pythons all over the world. Giants may exist on the mainland, where large prey is common, but on islands, they get smaller. The smaller the island, the smaller they are. But what was the prey like for Komodo dragons? And the key is, was. Today, Komodo dragons eat things like goats, pigs, deer, and water buffalo. But those are all things that have been introduced by humans to the island in the relatively recent past. Dragons appear to have been on these islands for the better part of a million years, possibly much longer than that. But they did have dwarf, but still relatively large, maybe about 400 kilos large, proboscideans to eat. 
as well as smaller prey like giant rats, birds, other reptiles, and other mammals. We do have evidence that they at least scavenged, if not hunted, these proboscideans. So large prey and small prey were all a possibility. And given that Komodo dragons are much larger than their closest living relatives, the lace monitors of Australia, it is no wonder that we often use them as an example of insular gigantism, just like giant tortoises. Unless, of course, there is reason to think that their ancestors were even larger than they are. So let's go back to Australia for a moment and look at this. This absolute legend of a dragon is Megalania. It might have gotten as large as seven meters long. Komodos are three meters long, just for the record. Even the low end estimates for Megalania are over four and a half meters, well over a meter longer than the largest Komodo ever known. If this is the ancestor of Komodo dragons, then it would imply that they are not, indeed, island giants, but rather island dwarfs. But it doesn't seem that the ancestors of Komodos got to where they are from Australia directly, though their ancestors almost certainly were from Australia originally. It appears that they migrated first to the island of Timor. We know about this from fossils of large monitors that we find there, which are also larger than Komodo dragons, but smaller than Megalania. So the process of insular dwarfism may have involved more than one island, and even more than the six known to have been home to Komodos. But when it comes to places like Komodo and Flores, we actually don't have much direct evidence of dwarfism or gigantism. The fossils that we have appear to be about the same exact size as Komodos of today. So if they are island dwarfs, the dwarfism may have already occurred before they got to where they are today. In other words, we have no fossil evidence at all that Komodo dragons are island giants. And the evidence that we do have for island dwarfism in Komodos suggests that it may have happened not where the dragons are on the islands where they currently reside, but potentially on the islands from which they came. And now I want to talk for a moment about how they got there, specifically what virgin birth has to do with it and why female Komodo dragons not only can produce male clones, but only produce male clones, while female pythons only produce female clones. So let me start with Athena here. Athena in Greek mythology, whose full name is Athena Parthos, Parthos meaning virgin, grew from the forehead of Zeus. Our Athena has a mother, but no father. She is the result of a virgin birth, Parthenogenesis. And given that all of her genes came from her mother, it probably isn't too surprising that she's female, and so are all of her clutch mates. And this really seems to not be very uncommon among island dwarf reticulated pythons. And it's always the case that all of the babies are females. And while it also happens in mainland reticulated pythons, I don't find it shocking at all that it seems to be more common in these island populations because of the difficulty of finding a mate when you wash up on the shore of an island. Now, it isn't that pythons started doing parthenogenesis because they're alone on an island. In fact, I'm pretty confident that snakes that wash up alone on an island are no more able to do parthenogenesis than are snakes on the mainland. Some tiny minority of them can probably do it. And the majority simply live out their lives, childless and alone, unless they arrive gravid or a male happens to wash up on the same shore before she dies. It no doubt happens, as lightning can strike in the same place twice, but more often than not, she probably dies without ever reproducing. A few hundred years later, a male washes up and he too dies, sad and alone, with only a volleyball to keep him company. Unless that female was one of the oddballs that could reproduce by parthenogenesis. In which case, when that male washes up, instead of finding a land of isolation, he finds the land of the Amazons and a new sexually reproducing population is born. And thus, island populations are much more likely to be the descendants of individuals that can reproduce by parthenogenesis than are those on the mainland. Now, it's important to note that Athena is not a clone of her mother. Not a full clone, anyway. She is a half clone. What I mean by this is that she received half of her mother's chromosomes, one of each chromosomal pair, just like you did. But since no sperm ever arrived to deliver the other half, her mother's half simply made copies of itself. And boom, she had a pair of each. Both chromosomes are identical. She is as inbred as it's possible to be. She is homozygous for literally everything, which is often less than ideal. Inbreeding does not cause mutations, 
But if you have any nasty recessive alleles in your genome, and most of us do, it greatly increases the likelihood that your offspring will receive two copies of those nasty recessive alleles and they will be expressed in all of their nastiness. So there's always been a real chance that she would just drop dead on us one day. Which is part of why Garrett Hartle of Reach Out Reptiles first sent her to me. He didn't feel right selling her to anyone in case that happened, but he knew that I would not only love her, but that I would love her more because of it. And I do. But she's an adult now, so it looks like she hit the jackpot in the chromosomal lottery. Pythons, being XY, like humans, the mother only has two X chromosomes. When reproducing by parthenogenesis, she can either give the X that she got from her mom or the X that she got from her dad. Her babies will, as a result, have either two copies of their grandmother's X and be female, or two copies of their grandfather's X and be female. But something else is going on in Komodo dragons. They're still half clones. All of that's the same. But Komodo dragons do not have XY sex determination. They have ZW sex determination, which is actually very common in lizards, including most snakes, and in birds. ZW works just like XY, except it's the female that has two different chromosomes. Males are ZZ, females are ZW. And this matters big time when it comes to making a half clone. Because instead of giving an X to every baby, female Komodo dragons can give either a Z or a W. And thus when they reproduce by parthenogenesis, producing half clones, each baby will either be a ZZ male or a WW dead. Just as dead as you would be if you were YY. So approximately half of the eggs will never develop. Others may not develop due to nasty recessives. But those that hatch and then make it to adulthood have no nasty recessives in them. And if you are going to create the ideal inbred mate for yourself, this is the perfect one. So just like that, a Komodo dragon can produce her own mate, and off they go. And that is why we think that Komodo dragons, the largest lizards on the planet today, are likely insular dwarfs, not giants. Why all of their cloned offspring are males, and why that seems to be so much more common on islands. And now you know. As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. Most people think of large, fire-breathing, flying reptiles that go around burninating the countryside. That was a smile out of Jason. <laughs> he knows. Mm -hmm. What does he know? Burninating the villagers. <laughs> and often a lot of open niche space. Niche. Yeah. <laughs> From his forehead? Like mm -hmm. big zip? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've never had that happen? No, not yet. No wonder nobody worships you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I gotta say, I've never thought of creating my ideal mate by... <laughs> you, uh, read, read the rest of that. Your ideal inbred mate for yourself. If you got an inbreed, <laughs> that's your person. And so you got this... Island of women. Mm -hmm. and the island of the Amazons. Yada, yada, yada. Eventually a male drops by and, and, and now you have they a reading. Could you imagine if that was the, 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 the plot of Castaway? <laughs> <laughs> but he's true to Helen Hunt the whole time. <laughs> and then he gets back to the mainland and she's married that other guy. Oh, oh snap. That is a movie. Oh. That's the movie! <laughs> oh, we're making that movie.